evening, everybody. Welcome to the virtual red bench. Um, a lot of people in the audience and a lot of new faces. So for those of you that um, don't know me, I am Abby. I'm the director at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. While this series is 100% virtual this year, um, the museum is open Friday through Sunday from noon to five. So if you're local or planning a road trip, we hope you'll come visit us soon. We're currently running a staycation raffle through the weekend for anyone that visits us in person. There's no cost to enter. You just have to stop by. Um, some fun goodies, hats, socks, all sorts of things that you could win. Uh, the virtual Red Bench speaker series is complimentary. However, this is an important fundraiser for us. So if you have the means to support this series financially, financially we hope that you will. And thank you to those of you that already have. Our suggested donation is $10 because that's what it was when these were in person. Uh, the museum is a nonprofit organization and every bit helps us continue our mission and continue to bring you these events. And thanks to the generosity of Darn Tough, your donation will enter you into a raffle for a free pair of socks. A $10 donation will get you one entry, $20 get you two entries, so on and so on. I'll raffle off two pairs and I will draw the winners tomorrow to give you plenty of time to make those donations tonight. Um, shortly, I will put that link in the chat for you. If you have already donated, because some of you have, um, thank you. And you will be included in that raffle as well. Uh, becoming a member is another important way to support the museum. Membership starts at $60 a year and comes with a slew of benefits, the most tangible being our membership benefit book with approximately $1,000 in savings. Um, this book provides discounts on lift tickets, cross-country tail fees, lodging, retail, and golf. The list of discounts and additional benefits can be found on our website, so take a look and I hope you decide to join the museum family. We have an exciting event for you tonight, sure to be informative, entertaining, and maybe even a little nostalgic. I wanna thank our Red Bench sponsors, Sisler Builders and Vermont Ski and Ride for supporting this series. Our moderator tonight, uh, many of you probably know, is Meredith Scott. Meredith has been with the museum since 2002 as the curator, then the director and the curator. And since 2014, she's been the part-time curator. Um, Meredith has put together a wonderful panel tonight who she'll introduce shortly. We're gonna be doing the Q&A a little differently tonight. Instead of waiting until the end of the presentation, as you have questions, type them into the Q&A box. We'll moderate that throughout the event and get to as many questions as we can um, as we move through the discussion. And with that, I hand this off to you, Meredith. Thanks, Abby. This is so fun. What a it makes me a little nostalgic looking at all those names, lots of people from my museum past, and it's been really fun to get together with this group again, as lots of um, connections to past exhibits and past events. So I thought I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how this came together, because um, there are these two stories that are happening tonight. We're telling the story of Stowe and then Stowe's No Dive, and then a little bit about the development of Mammoth. Um, so Mike Leach, who is the historian of the Mount Mansfield Ski Club, and Brian Lindner, who is the historian at the Mount Mansfield, at Stowe Mountain Resort, um, have collected a massive amount of information. It is amazing. And they have spent so much time distilling it into even these wonderful slides that you're going to see tonight. It's a wonderful pictorial um, history. So we have been putting this together. And meanwhile, Abby and I had both heard about this wonderful book that Robin has written. Here it is, it's backwards I know, but For the Love of It, which is a story of Dave and Roma McCoy. And I had received it from Rosie and from my college roommate's mom and from all these different places. And as I've been reading it, I was thinking there are so many parallels to Stowe because the story is, the story of the nosedive and the story of Dave is about how skiing, how it became what it is, how a resort became what these two different resorts, despite the difference in geography, have had very similar histories. So it seemed kind of wonderful to find a way to put these two stories together. So that's how this evening came together. It's also really wonderful because both Robin and Rosie are documented in Mike's wonderful archives as having raced on the nose dive. <laughs> and, and we're really happy they have this wonderful, they are the overlap between Stowe and Mammoth because Rosie was training in Vermont and then she went out to Mammoth. So these, 
they're kind of bringing these two stories together. So what we're going to do is talk about the nosedive. Mike and Brian are going to go through these wonderful pictures. And then we're going to switch over to talk about mammoth and about um, racing at that time and end with a quick, wonderful um, segment from the movie Mammoth Dreams. So as Abby said, I have seen a lot of these slides. So if you can put your questions in the q and I'm going to try to slot them in as they come up. A lot of them I think might get answered as we go on. So don't be dismayed if I don't answer them because I think it's going to be because I, Mike and Brian are going to hit on it later. And if not, we'll answer them at the end. So that's our plan for tonight. Thank you to Mike and Brian and Robin and Rosie. And take it away, Mike. Hey, let me see if I can share my screen. Right, Meredith, you can see that? I got it, see it. <clears throat> this uh, happens to be a presentation here that we did on the nosedive. It's uh, probably about 40 slides. Um, this first slide actually happens to have a picture of uh, the octagon and everyone sitting around the red bench. So it's sort of interesting because this, uh, is this red bench is now a centerpiece in the ski museum and it's the kind of what the series is called. So. And I think Brian Lindner's mom might be in this picture, too. <clears throat> yeah, I believe that's my mom on the right side taking a sip of coffee there. Um, uh, she was in the beginning stages of dementia when she saw it. She says, well, I don't think that's me, but I'm pretty convinced that's my mother. My parents actually met in the, in the octagon when my dad was on ski patrol. Yeah, and if people don't remember the octagon when it had, and I don't, but when it had a fireplace in the center, that's uh, everyone sitting around it, so... Anyway, oh, there we go, Brian. So these are the two guys that really uh, bear the responsibility uh, for creating the nosedive. Uh, that's Charlie Lord standing there on the left. Charlie was an engineer and a surveyor with the Vermont Highway Department when he was laid off uh, during the Depression. Uh, and sitting on the uh, step of the car is Ab Coleman, Abner Coleman. Uh, he was a map maker and he was also a surveyor and the two of them combined forces as, as, as Mike will tell you in this, this presentation on how they ended up creating the nosedive. These were avid skiers before skiing was really popular in Vermont and we'll come back to both of them uh, during this presentation. I would just add that uh, these, both of these guys were uh, members of the Mount Mansfield Ski Club and they both served as presidents at one point and uh, and Abner Coleman actually is the one who put together the ski club's um, newsletters starting back in 1935. Um, they're a great source of information on the history of the mountain, and I have those. Uh, I've actually posted them on our ski club website for anybody who wants to see them. So here are some of the other key characters in this story. Um, up in the upper left is Perry Merrill. He was the commissioner of the Vermont, commissioner of the Vermont Department of Forestry. And Perry had, uh, I believe it was his graduate studies, he had done in Scandinavia. And he had seen what the Scandinavians were doing with their mountains and skiing. And he wanted to do something similar here in Vermont. Uh, below him is Al Gottlieb from Stowe. Uh, Al uh, was... Uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner of Forestry in Vermont. And the two of them get tied together because when the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, was created by Franklin Roosevelt, each state needed someone to coordinate the CCC activities. And Perry Merrill uh, was it in Vermont. Uh, he pretty much decided which projects would be uh, tackled. Al Gottlieb, uh, as the deputy, uh, was somewhat more of the operations guy, particularly in Stowe. Uh, in fact, uh, initial um, clear cutting of the North Slope, for example, at Stowe was all done under Al Gottlieb's supervision. The photo in the upper right uh, is actually of Charlie Lord standing in the middle of the photo during the cutting of the Bruce Trail. Um, so th this picture is included because it just shows you typically what the CCC boys looked like when they were out cutting trails. I've got and, 
Okay. And the, one of the things I like to point out in this particular picture is that guy up in the left-hand side of the picture looking at the camera eating a sandwich is Paul Barkman from White River Junction. In the day that they finished cutting the Bruce Trail, which was the first purpose-cut ski trail in Vermont, Paul Barkman put his skis on and skied down, meaning he became the first person in Vermont to ski uh, an actually designated trail in this state. And uh, <clears throat> also included a little bit of the uh, Mount Mansfield Ski Club article, the association. The ski Club played a significant role in the early days of Mount Mansfield skiing, not just boosting interest in skiing, but actually providing facilities and related services. Um, before the creation of the Mount Mansfield Company in the late 40s, there was no central centralized responsibility for the facilities in the re region, and uh, the club would serve from the beginning as a general planning and coordinating agency for all the development of the mountain. And in addition to helping to provide facilities, um, the club would host competitions, and they also started the ski school and the ski patrol. And that patch in the middle is the club's actually first patch. Um, so this, um, this is a pretty interesting photo that um, was in the New England Ski Museum journal um, from the Henry Sheldon Museum collection. It shows the uh, nosedive when it was cut. And this is a, it was, it was completed in the spring of 1935, but this is a photo from 1939. And you can really see how narrow the trail is and uh, like how many little turns it has. It's uh, much wider these days. Um, and on the left here is what I believe is the first trail map I've, I've seen of Mount Mansfield. And down the bottom, it has an AWC, which is Abner Coleman. And Abner Coleman would have uh, created this, but you can see um, at the time the nosedive was finished, and this map's probably from about 35, 36 season. You can see the nosedive is a trail and, and also the chin clip was cut in the same year. And it's not the chin clip where we know it today. It's a chin clip that's located further up in the notch where, where that picnic area is. And it used to go up so far and sort of towards Taft Lodge and, and kind of dead end before it. And the smuggler's trail or the old smuggler's trail existed and it kind of came out by Barnes Camp. And then of course we had the Bruce Trail. Um, this photo down at the lower right is a picture of um, uh, probably about the same time period, 1939, it's a picture of Barnes Camp and it has a sign saying to the Merrill Run and to the Nosedive Ski Run and to the race. Um, so, anyway. So these are a couple of uh, postcards, uh, Richardson postcards of the Nosedive. Um, and, and by the way, I got to give credit to Mike. He, he put this slideshow together. What you're seeing is really his handiwork. I, I played a minor role in it, but uh, did a fantastic job. And uh, here you see on the left, you can see how narrow the nosedive was. This is down below the turns. And originally it was pretty narrow because everything had to be cut by hand. Uh, there were no chainsaws up in there. Then the photo on the right appears to be up in the original seven turns. You can see the double fall line, you see how narrow it is. Uh, but that, those are early views of the, of the nosedive. So one bit of tradition for the trail had its origins in the 1930s when the nosedive ski appeared on the market. Um, it's shown in the center here. This was a, a line known as ski sport skis and they were manufactured by the Derby and Ball Company in Waterbury, Vermont. Um, the company was owned by Bill Mason, who's pictured here on the right, and his uh, brother-in-law, Dan Ryder. Um, both of them were ski club directors and would also serve as presidents at one time of the club. Um, according to the company, uh, as the nosedives, the skis became more widely distributed throughout the country. There were a few who chose to object to the suggestion contained in such a name for the ski. And, uh, the short-lived honorarium for the Mount Mansfield Trail was dropped as a result. Um, these, I took this picture of these skis that are actually in the Adventure Center and um, Meredith has a display in there from the museum and 
Also in there is a, uh, you know, in this little advertisement here on the left, uh, there was also a set fish, separate fist model pair of skis on display there too. SEP was uh, brought on to that company as a technical consultant. So um, anyone would like to learn a little more about that company um, in the, in the uh, ski clubs newsletters from 1950, there's a uh, July 1950, there's a great article on how that, how that uh, company came about. Um, they used to, uh, they used to make, uh, you know, hand scythes or I don't know how you say it, but you know, for like cutting grass before you had weed whackers. So they were used to bending wood and then it was sort of a natural that they would able to uh, transfer into skis when one of the guys working there was making a pair for another guy's son and uh, before you knew it, they're making skis, but it's a pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> Another really cool thing in the museum is a pair of Ab Coleman's skis of Derby and Ball too, I think, with his initials and painted in green. They're pretty wonderful. Um, the first race on Mount Mans on the nosedive, first sanctioned race was February 23rd, 1936. It was the Vermont State Championship. Um, you can look at this photo on the right. Um, the nosedive was like, a lot more terrain, very narrow. Um, I think that race probably didn't have a whole lot of gates on it. I think it was just a matter of running the trail. Um, and, um, you know, so the racers didn't have too much of a chance to pick a specific line. They basically turned where the trail turned. And uh, But the guy who won that race was Bob Borden. And Bob Borden was uh, a little bit famous in the fact that he was – um, the first rider on the rope tow at Woodstock, which was the first lift in the country. Um, when he came up to this race, uh, he basically hadn't skied a wooded trail. He skied open slope type trails, um, but he won this race comfortably in a time of two minutes, 35 seconds. Um, I think what he lacked in experience in these wooded trails, he probably gained by taking lots of runs on the rope tow and getting more mileage in than anybody else. But um, um, but anyway, yeah. Mike, do the um, race results exist from all these races? You found them in the store reporter, right? And, and in the club newsletter? What's that? The race results from these early races? Um, I got the, I don't have a full set of race results from this, but one thing, one place that results do exist is in the free press. And I gave Brian a bunch of dates, key dates over the times in the 30s. And Brian visited the state archives and he, and he got copies of a whole lot of um, race results for me, um, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, you don't see the kind of press in the paper nowadays, but back then there was like tons of, tons of press on these races. It was a big deal. Even the first race on the, the Bruce Trail, it was a, like 12 people formal race and the starter actually cricked his stopwatch to time the race and then did the race himself and that was in the free press <laughs> so but anyway um in the mid 30s um we had a lady named ann cook who arrived in stowe and spent a lot of time um skiing skiing the nosedive and gained quite a reputation and uh, earned a nickname nosedive annie um you know, within two, within, when she arrived, she really hadn't ever skied before. And when within two years, she was skiing in the nationals, U.S. nationals. And 1940, she, you know, qualified as an alternate on the 1940 Olympic team. Um, she had a, uh, she designed and fabricated clo clothing in her shop in Stowe. Um, this photo up in the upper left-hand side, I pulled from an old race program in 1938, which showed showed her at the top of the nosedive and it had that little, um, that little quote said powder at the summit of the nosedive. I thought that was pretty cool. And on the left, I'm on the right, sorry, um, is, a, is actually a song about her. And it was on Ski Club letter, Letterhead. I had somebody email me a few years ago um, who bought a piece of property in Southern Vermont, which had an abandoned camp on it. And, and they found a bunch of papers in that camp and one of which was this, and he sent it to me. and. Uh, so 
Yeah, it sang to the tune of uh, Casey Jones. So um, you can't really read the whole song here, but I don't know whether club members got together and started singing these songs or or Ski Patrol was singing these songs. I guess you had to find, be creative in finding things to do when we, days we didn't have electronics, I guess. <laughs> Um, in 1937, um, the Eastern Championships were supposed to be held on the Thunderbolt Trail in Mount Greylock, Mass. And with three days, um, with three days notice, because of lack of snow, they rescheduled for Stowe. And uh, this, um, this turned out to be a huge race uh, with lots of spectators. And um, the, uh, you can see down in the lower left, the traffic, um, there wasn't, there wasn't a significant amount of parking up at uh, up at Mansfield at that time, so my guess is this: they were parked at Mansfield all the way back down to the road to Toll Road here. Um, the guy on the um, right is um, Dick Durrance, who is probably the best racer in the country at the time. Um, he's got his COVID shield on there, I guess, and um, he uh, he actually got beat by his brother Jack Durrance, and. Uh, but I think this was the first race that actually put Stowe on the map as a major race venue. Um, I believe the word was that it took till midnight to untangle this traffic jam um, anyway. And so. Some things don't change, but Brian and I were um, remembering, well, the museum has a sign that says the parking was 25 cents. Brian, did you tell us when it went to that parking system? Yeah, in the, when the single chair was built in uh, 40, it was either that year or the next that the state of Vermont, that the forestry department started charging 25 cents per car to park at the Mansfield lot. Uh, and my grandfather, Claude Adams, was a guy that collected that quarter for many decades until he retired in actually in 1960, uh, at which point you didn't have to pay to park at Stowe anymore. But for the early years, 25 cents to park your car to go skiing. Yeah, this photo on the upper left is, is from the same year. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not from this race, but it gives you an idea of what the trail and the conditions, there was no grooming at the time. So uh, anyway. And people were walking to the race start, right? Or hiking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these are some great photos here of Sep Rush skiing. Uh, the one on the left, Sep has come down from the upper nosedive, uh, which is what you see when you get off the quad looking up towards the TV towers. He's come down off the upper nosedive. He's crossing over the toll road right here in a beautiful Arlberg technique, and he's about to pitch over the top of the nosedive. Um, just great elegance here, but that's a, it's a, a photo of Sep, the technical advisor who helped build this trail um, and improve it. Um, is, is pictured there. Uh, down at the bottom is Sep again making some nice turns. The photo on the top right I really enjoy uh, and Mike I can't scroll down to see the uh, the signs so you'll have to read the signs but for those oh, of you yeah. for those of you familiar with the uh, getting off the quad today and going over to the top of the nosedive you know just as you pitch over by the stone hut if you look to your right, there's a couple of snowmaking hydrants in there, and it's a dead end. It's a cul-de-sac. Well, we when you look at this picture, there acts. It's very dramatic, and it was a great old postcard. But there, it's Sep and another instructor who I don't know. The, the other instructor is actually taking a jump. They're skiing into that cul-de-sac, which looks dramatic. But you got to wonder how quickly they screeched to a halt there. Yeah, so this sign out in front of them says state game Re refuge, hunting is unlawful. And then this white sign behind them says trail closed, maintenance work being done, please cooperate. And then there's a black sign here next to that one says nosedive closed, anyone skiing on closed, closed trails will not be allowed to use lift. So, so some things never change. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Um, Actually, the ski club uh, won a bid for hosting the um, 
1938 U.S. Nationals. Um, on March 5th, 6th, 1938. And, and actually this program over here on the right, um, actually in the bottom says uh, April, Women's, Women's Nationals, April 9th and 10th. So they actually on two separate occasions hold nationals for both men and women. And we have the distinction of actually holding the first ever U.S. Nationals for women right here on this trail. So it's pretty cool. Um, the ski club actually had people was gonna donate money to the cause to host this and they actually didn't accept money from anybody. There was a big thing back in those days about being amateur and not liking commercial entities taking, taking money from them. So they made these uh, pins down below which they sold for $1.25 each. Um, these, these race programs were sold for 25 cents and uh, apparently they had a admission for $1. Um, there was, like I said, uh, Brian, Brian printed out a bunch of uh, um, free press clippings, a ton of them leading up to this race. There was a lot of coverage um, and they actually, they actually talked about parking and getting there early and all the instructions what to do, which they probably didn't do in that last race. And the parking issue wasn't quite, the, quite so extreme. And the the crowd was a little bit less for this, but nonetheless, um, the downhill started about 200 yards up above the toll road where the toll road crosses the nosedive. And um, <clears throat> the slalom was on the nosedive as well. Um, one thing to remember about all these races is that there was no lift at the time. So everything to run that race, has to be hiked up and then the competitors actually have to hike up whether they hike up toll road or hike up the trail itself. Um, and that race by the way started at 2 30 in the afternoon. So um, here, here's, a, here's some shots uh, of either some racers or some shots from the race like this this shows the finish um, which is which is a I, I know the lower part of nose dive changed a lot, but there was a lot of like very steep sections there. The nose dive um, finish was actually quite dramatic of a drop. Um, the um, the winner of the um, the race was um, Ulrich Buter, who was from Germany, um, two minutes thirty five seconds, and Dick Durrance was second, about five seconds behind him, and Walter Prager from. I think he was by then at Dartmouth, he was in third, like 14 seconds behind. Um, you know, the, the women's race was won by this little clipping down here it says Beverly girl wins downhill. That was Marion McKean. She won with a time of two minutes, 56 seconds. And she won by 46 seconds, which is by today's standards, it's crazy. But you got to remember that, um, you know, most of these skiers in this race may have may have been only ski racing for like, a, or even skiing for a couple of years. I mean, I know Mar this, this skier on the right is uh, Marilyn Shaw, who actually skied in this race when she was 13 years old. And by 38, she she was maybe only skiing for three years. I don't I don't know exactly, but she was taught by her mom and and also coached by Seth. Um, Marilyn actually. Um, finished 12th in this downhill, five minutes, 34 seconds. But uh, she was probably the first racer in Vermont to really win high honors in ski racing. Um, she eventually at 15 years old would win the 1940 U.S. National Combined Champion and at age 15 won the National Slalom title. Um, she and her sister, Barbara, um, between 1939 and 1942 was winning most everything in the East. Um, down in the lower lower left-hand corner is a picture of Nosedive Annie racing. And, and honestly, I think that was after ski, skiing for two years. Um, so it's pretty impressive. And, and, and I believe that's the start where it shows basically a flag and then someone probably just like telling her when she can go. So I think most of the races at this time were done with a stopwatch um, and maybe a radio to the bottom where they also stop, started the clock. Um, the only casualty in this race was actually Sepp Roos. He actually fell and dislocated his ankle, got up quickly and still finished 13th. <laughs> so anyway.
Mike, um, was there a fee to race? Pardon? Was there a fee to race? Uh, good question. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. I know that I know that in 1938, the ski club, it was the first year that they started a ski team. And in our newsletters, they said anyone wishing to race, the ski club would pay their entry fees. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that these did have a fee to be in the race. Um, so. And was the women's course the same as the men's? Did it just have a lower start? I think the women, um, always started a little bit lower. Um, I think in some races, they started right at the top of what's current nose dive now. And sometimes they started down below the seven turns. Um, I, I can't remember exactly this race. And then one more question about this slide is, was yeah. the Beverly girl refers to the fact that she's from Beverly, Mass? Yes, yes, Marion McKean. She was, uh, um, she was on the US ski team in the thirties. And I think probably one of the better um, one of the best uh, ski racers of the time. I think she's actually traveled to Europe with some of the U.S. ski team. And so she had a bit of experience coming here, although she didn't win the slalom. Grace Lindley won the slalom. Um, but uh, yeah, winning by 46 seconds. You got to, it's pretty good. And another thing about these races back then is I think um, you probably did pretty well if you could actually make a whole run without falling, you know. Because actually, Marilyn won the 1940 U.S. National Combined because she was the only one that didn't fall, <laughs> which is pretty pretty amazing. So, but challenging challenging times back then for skiers. So we have to realize how difficult it was. So, so these pictures here, um, the one on the left is 1952. That's a member of the Mount Mansfield Ski Patrol taking a, a, an old 10th Mountain Division toboggan down. And he's approaching Shambles Corner, which is still shaped much like that today, except it's so much wider today than it was back then. Uh, and in the right, bottom right-hand corner uh, is some patrolmen from 1945 or 46. The one closest to camera on the left there is my dad. Erwin Lindner, he was a ski patrol director, 10th Mountain veteran. Uh, in the middle is Sears Raymond, uh, who was a longtime patroller and later uh, supervisor in the uh, Separ Separush Ski School. And the fellow on the right is Chet Judge, who was a volunteer patroller who came up on weekends, actually stayed with us, um, and a member of Mount Mansfield Ski Patrol. And they're perched right on the top of the nosedive, right where it pitches off the toll road. In the upper right corner, um, the fellow on the left is Roger Langley, president of the Eastern Amateur Ski Association. And the fellow in the middle is Minnie Dole, Seaman Not Dole. And they come into the nosedive uh, in 1938 uh, when the uh, national races were taking, the men's national races were taking place. And <clears throat> Dole had come up to help uh, as a member of the Mount Mansfield Ski Patrol to organize the patrol response for any accidents. Uh, and we still have some of the paperwork from that and the maps and policies and procedures that they had laid out. Uh, it was just incredibly well structured. And during the race, Roger Langley here on the left strolled across the trail to Minnie Dole who was standing on the other side and basically said to him, I said, hey Minnie, this organization that's here that we're looking at, this Mount Mansfield Ski Patrol is amazing. And, and would you take on the task of organizing a national ski patrol based on what we see here at Stowe? And as Minnie Dole basically said later, he said he didn't know how big a thing he was biting off, but he said, sure, yeah, I'll take that on. And thus is the birth of the National Ski Patrol on Shambles Corner uh, on the nosedive during the 1938 races. Uh, and for those of you that are aware, Minnie Dole later was clearly the instigator for the creation of the 10th Mountain Division during World War II. He's often credited with organizing it, but I think he was more of an instigator than an organizer, although he did all the original recruiting for it, or the bulk of the original recruiting. Uh, so there's some ski patrol history tied directly to the nosedive. Um, Brian, just quickly. Yes. Um, first of all, someone says you look just like your dad. 
<laughs> Secondly, um, maybe, do you have any of your dad's skis? Could you give us a sense of how tall he was and how tall and heavy his skis might have been if he was going down this? Yeah, my dad was 5'8", and probably in those days, I'm guessing he was around 170, maybe. Uh, and uh, I can remember him teaching me uh, to select my skis the way that he did, and that was to stand flat-footed, reach as high in the air as you possibly could, and the ski length that you were looking for, the tip would hit you right in the wrist. Um, which I look at that length today and say, oh my God, how did we ever turn those things? Yeah. Particularly with leather boots on. Um, Thanks. Now, uh, Al Gottlieb, who I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, was uh, Vermont Dep Forestry Department, but also uh, with the CCC. And Al recognized uh, the growth of the ski industry. Everybody realized that there was going to be more and more accidents. Uh, it, it was just inevitable. So using the resources of the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, Gottlieb had uh, the first toboggan caches built around, not only on Mount Mansfield, but around the entire community on areas where we don't even think of skiing today, yet they were skiing back in the 1930s. And, and the data isn't exactly known to myself or confirmed to myself, but you're talking around 1934 to 35, 36, I would say, when he had these caches built. And they were typical CCC construction, um, very well built, overbuilt, I must say. And if you look very closely at the opening, you can actually see the white banding. These things were lead lined to protect the, the items in, inside. And this particular cache here is at the bottom of the seven turns on the nosedive. And inside it, you'll see the very first purpose-made uh, ski toboggans, or ski patrol toboggans in the United States. These were based on the earliest known rescue on Mount Mansfield. And that's roofing tin that the CCC boys curled up in the front, reinforced it with wood, uh, and then had rope handles on it. And you can only imagine how difficult it would be to turn these things with all that corrugation as they're coming down the mountain. Uh, in 1995 or 1996, Carl Wrighton off the ski patrol found one of these pretty much intact uh, up in ranch camp and that is now uh, in the uh, ski museum in Stowe. It's very well preserved. It's pretty interesting number 15 on the list here is Pinnacle Trail. Um, I've seen another map that shows a some old trails that came up and up and through Pinnacle. So there was a toboggan cache up there somewhere. Yep. Anyway. What's Devil's dish pan? Um, from Ranch Camp, it goes up over um, Mount Dewey, sort of over through a gap towards the uh, Underhill side. It's that, it's that little saddle, I think, that, you know, between the nose and the Mount Dewey. The, the remnants of that cache are still there, by the way. In no. Devil's Dishpan. Oh, wow. That's cool. I can get this one. Um, in, in the fall of 38, the cl ski club had a trails committee and they did a trail survey on the mountain and they did a detailed trail survey of um, you know, of the nosedive. And um, all of the sections were labeled um, seven turns called corkscrew. And then after those seven turns, it was kind of a straightaway, which is corridor. And then the strainer, the strainer is where Midway crosses, kind of crosses the trail. And it's where really the most recent sugar slum on nosedive kind of ended and where the sugar house was. But it's called strainer because it had trees, it kind of turned more, and there's a nice little art, artwork here that was in our newsletter that, that uh, yeah, pretty fun comic that said, what is known as going through the strainer, the nosedive. Um, and then the upper sh shambles corner, which is uh, on nosedive now where you come through that corner before you get to that long flat. That was like a very turny, very much more terrain in there than it is today. And uh, an interesting uh, point on this uh, 
survey is the last section called the gulch, which says it's at 34 degrees, which is actually the steepest section on the whole thing. So I think it was a pretty dramatic finish. Um, and anyway, and uh, yeah, there's a quote, I added a quote on here from Abner Coleman on the reason they wanted to do this survey and you can read that. Um, um, this, 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 excuse me, this, um, this trail survey, complete this and they would hang it in the toll house and the octagon once the octagon was built. So they would hang this around so people could, uh, could kind of see it there. Yeah. So where does, um, cliff, is it cliff trail? No, I, um, come in, you know, from the gondola. It's not cliff trail. Could yeah, yeah, uh, right around there, right okay. around where that strainer, right just on. below it, just below it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, probably in the upper shift section. And on this, you can see like little um, symbols for the uh, toboggan caches, where it's sort of like a, I don't know, like a, a sign time. there, whatever. These were where the toboggan caches were located, and. These are the name station, you know, I don't know if that was a patrol station um, and so forth, so, but it's pretty cool. Um, once they've got during the war years, they had to like scribble out all those elevations and because the war department didn't allow them to display any elevations on maps. All right. Um, when the club was founded, they realized very early, if people are gonna get total enjoyment out of the sport, someone's gonna to have to teach them to ski. And in 1934, 35 season, they hired a ski instructor and started a ski school. The ski instructor's name was Jim Trachier. And he was a UNH ski racer. And uh, best I can tell is they yanked him out of school after his sophomore, uh, sophomore first semester to come up and teach at, at Mount Mansfield. And they operated um, out of the toll house. And the clubs, the ski club's first president, his name was Frank Griffin. He managed this operation at the toll house. He, he along with Craig Bird and others, actually installed a rope tow at the toll house. And, uh, and then a couple years later, um, Frank Griffin and the ski club hired Sepp Rouge. After Sepp's first year, um, he actually was considering, I think it was after the first year, he was considering maybe going somewhere else. And um, the ski club kind of worked out, a, you know, and all parties interested, they kind of worked out an arrangement where they would allow Sepp to like take uh, management of his own ski school and actually manage this toll house area. So this sign, th this sign uh, here, where it says Mount Mansfield Ski School, and this is this would actually then change the Sepruce Ski School, and so Frank Griffin at the time actually moved up to the nosedive base, and he installed another rope tow, which uh, was at the foot of um, North Slope, what we see today, and he actually opened another branch of the ski school, so when. Sepp named his ski school down here, Sepp Ski School. He called his Mount Mansfield Ski School. So, um, and his head ski instructor from here, it's hard to, I guess hard to read that sign, but it was Willie Benedict uh, was the, and I think there's uh, not many photos of this building. It's, I think, Brian seems to think it's in, was located in the permit lot next to the present base lodge. Um, um, but this, this building would have been there only for, uh, you know, a few years until the state shelter, or the current base lodge was built. Um, this was an interesting, um, this was an interesting map that Brian had. It says uh, Mount Mansfield Ski School, Nosedive Ski Toe and Nosedive Ski Hut. And you can see, you can see the map of Nosedive and you can see how, how turny, sharp little turns there were on Nosedive. And at the bottom, you could actually bail out towards Barnes Camp, and then you could bail out. And that's where that little uh, cabin was. And then there was a rope tow here. But uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, another map um, to show for the, so anyway. The ski hut being a stone hut. The, not this one. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, this one, Frank Griffin managed like a food concession and 
manage the, they had probably had ski, ski patrol services out of there and also the ski school. So uh, yeah, anyway. So yeah, so the ski club started the ski school. Um, when you look at that map, 19... like that Houghton Trail, that's, is that part of the long trail or is that a different trail now? I think the Houghton Trail was cut so that it gave you a way to get back to the lodge. Because the Actually, lodge was, you know, kind of also a place where people stayed and there was, um, you know, he also had the toll house right there and Sep, Sep was then in charge of the ski school there and at the lodge actually there was a guy from Fran France named Jacques Charmoz who came for about three years and was a ski instructor at the lodge. So I think this was a means to kind of get back over and actually they ended up cutting a trail along the road called the road, tr road trail I think so people weren't skiing in the road. Um, all, along the way back. Yeah, and the, Hout the, the Houghton uh, went to the lodge. It also went to what's now the parking lot at Bingham Falls, which was the location of the original den, the den. And the proprietor was, was, was Mrs. Jesse Houghton. Yeah. So this, this is the only trail, the Houghton is the only trail at Stowe named after a female. Ah, there's an interesting piece of trivia. And actually that, when it came down to the Bingham Falls, there was actually some touring trails that you could go down over Bingham Falls. I don't know if there was a bridge, but it actually circled all the way back down to what I think is the Mill Trail now, all the way back down into, um, down by Matterhorn. So there was a kind of a touring trail, so Great. anyway. So um, 1939, Roland Palmetto, offered a suggestion that event a season event be installed on the Mount Mansfield calendar and the sugar slalom was born. It was decided that conditions permitting, it would be held annually the last weekend of April. It was to be a fun race and skiers, racers or not, were to be accepted as entrants. The first race was April 30th. I mean, that's pretty late. And but you know that upper section of nosedive really is probably where the snow lasts longest, so that made a great place for it. Um, and the first one, the course was set by Hannah Schneider from station 13 to 35. Now, station 13 was that spot right below the seven turns, so it started there and finished to station 35, which was all the way down to like Shambles Corner, which is as you're coming onto the flat. And in different years, the race would have been at different spots. Sometimes it started very, very top, came through the turns, you know, and finished at different places. Um, the first winner is this gentleman here in the middle, um, Milton Hutchinson. Um, he was a Mount Mansfield Ski Club racer. You can see he's got his uh, patch on his jacket there. Um, he was from Barrie. And uh, Marion McKean, who also won the national, she won this race here too. Um, as part of the sugar slum tradition is sugar on snow, of course. And uh, um, this guy down here on the lower right is Giz Gillen, who at least when I was racing, he was a fixture. And he was also my little league coach for quite a while. How, what um, do you think the miles per hour are on a race like this? No, nah, th this, th this one being a slalom wasn't, wasn't too fast. I think when they first started, this was sort of supposed to be kind of like a giant slalom type of set, but it's called sugar slalom. And uh, I, I think it varied, it varied, but speed wise, downhill? pardon? How about on the downhill? How fast? Oh, you well, we have some footage of that. So you okay, can great. guess for yourself, but from the turns down, I think speed's probably were pretty good. So um, in the second year, 1940, Marilyn Shaw won the sugar slalom. And that was the year she won the U.S. Nationals. And the Mount Mansfield Ski Club um, provided a perpetual Shaw Trophy to the winner in honor of her 1940 National Slalom title, uh, or combined title for the, for the winner. So I'm not sure what happened to that trophy, but if anybody ever finds that in their attic, I would love to, uh, love to see that. Um, in the second Sugar Slalom 1940, there was 162 competitors, which which was really big back then. And I saw a news clipping saying that it was perhaps the largest in the country of that year. So 
the race would stay pretty popular um, in, in 1952. Um, they had 268 competitors. In 1953, they switched to a two-day event um, where the first day kind of was a qualifying day to the next day. And we still do a two-day event, but we don't really require you to qualify for the second day. We just pack them all in, except I don't know about this year. But <laughs> So anyway, and I would say that race is not the oldest race in the country still going because the Fist Trophy and Suicide Six is older, but this has to be one of the oldest running, continuous running races in the country. One of them, I would say. Uh, all right, so we have a, like a short little bit of footage here. Bear with me while it kind of loads, please. This was taken by um, the Heath family. And it's just a little bit, of, it's a seven minute video um, which is on YouTube, and I don't know, if you want to see the whole thing, I can probably provide it for you, but this is just a two-minute piece. This is Sepro skiing down, and it's probably coming out of seven turns. Uh, Sepro skiing through the gates, and even skiing through around trees right there for some reason. I don't know. It's pretty. And uh, is this Peppy? I'm not sure what Peppy that means, if it's Peppy Gobble back then, but I don't know if he didn't come until 1950. This is actually from 1948, by the way. And that's Carl Acker. Oh, that's Peppy, actually. Um, Carl Acker, they spelled the last name wrong, A-C-K-E-R. But Carl Acker was Andrea Mead Lawrence coach in Pico. He was a Swiss ski instructor, kind of uh, kind of like Sepp Roos to Stowe. He was a pretty big, big coach over there. And you can kind of recognize a little bit that section right there as you come out of those three turns today. Um, it's a little bit more trees there probably, but um, Dave Lawrence, who he eventually would marry Andrew Mead Lawrence. Um, he was a US ski team, at, ski team racer as well. Um, Mike, did the sugar slalom run even during World War II? No, we'll get to that. Right. Sorry. Actually, uh, it ran 1940, 39, 40. It actually didn't, didn't happen in 41 because of the weather. Um, here's Andrea Mead Lawrence. Um, she would have been probably like 16 years old here, I think. So I think she was about 19 in Oslo Olympics. But she was pretty good. That's for sure. Another mammoth con connection, is it? Yes, she later moved to mammoth. Yeah. Adult life. All right. <laughs> so there is a seven minute clip of that, which is actually very, very nice. Um, oh, let me move on from there. All right. So 1940 was kind of a pivotal event, the state championships at, on the nosedive, because it was when the, uh, the records were established in the downhill. And I think records were always established on the nose by somehow this one was really a big deal. And this one actually held up until 1950. Um, and when it was broken 1950, it was on a much improved nose dive. So it didn't really, this is a record that stood for forever, I guess. Um, and this again was the, this was a downhill um, record set by Milton Hutchinson, who here on the far right. He is also the one that won the first sugar slalom um, down here. They get a picture of him in the American Ski Annual. So he was probably kind of a big enough deal to be kind of be putting a picture uh, nose dive record holder in the American Ski Annual. And um, the uh, the ladies downhill winner was, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but Stevia Corzon um, from the Otter Ski Club in Rutland. So they must have skied at Pico. Um, well, that, that ha she set a record as well. And that happens to be Susie Chaffee's mom. <laughs> I, I had this uh, printout of this uh, this newspaper clipping. I gave it to Susie Chappie and she was shocked. She didn't know anything about her mom's skiing career. <laughs> but um, Milton Hutchinson actually, he would work in Barrie, I think at the quarries um, doing something. And uh, he also like, in, he coached the kids at the Spalding High School in the fifties. And he had a very tragic accident and died when he got impaled by one of the slalom gates, which was probably a sapling um, while demonstrating some slalom. So that was a kind of a bummer. I'm sure lots of people will recognize Wendy Cram's name too from Woodstock and Manchester and 10th Mountain. Yeah. Member. yeah, Wendy Cram, 
And Victor Constant was a member of the ski club as well. He's actually uh, pretty well known too, and Bob must be from Dartmouth. But um, yeah, so those are those are big races. Brian, you can do that one. So this, I believe, is the uh, first official real trail map once we had uh, uh, uphill capacity. This is, I believe, 4041 season uh, with the coming of the single chair. And if you look on the left side, you can see wh where we ski today at Stowe is where skiing migrated to. It actually started uh, over in ranch camp on the left because everybody was hiking up and skiing down. Um, and Oof. with the coming of the, the cool. yep, uh, which you can see a little bit of the steeple left today if you look out in that area. Uh, today, that's all cross country and back country skiing. But that's really ranch camp you see in the middle of the left hand side there was truly the original base lodge at Stowe. And then you can see coming out from ranch camp and going uphill to the right is the Bruce. Uh, that's the first purpose-cut ski trail in Vermont, came in up at the top uh, where the quad ends today. Um, and then you, you, you can clearly see the nosedive here in 1940-41. And uh, Mike had mentioned earlier the original chin clip. That's showing way over in the right-hand corner where it came down into the notch. And I remember as a little boy, you could still look up that swath and see it was all little saplings at the time. Today, there's no hint of that trail whatsoever. Uh, the How original about that old smugglers trail. Is there any hint of that? You can't see it from this side. And I don't have a lot of information about smugglers trail, honestly. It was there, it was on the early trail map, but I'm not sure what came out of that. I would say an interesting thing on this slide is uh, in, in the in the new newsletter from when the single chair was installed, they, they published the uh, prices for tickets and the tickets were all one ride tickets and uh so you could get a 60 cent ticket one 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 ride or 75 cents on the weekends and uh, i actually looked at book of 10 one way rides five dollars like inflation adjusted that till today and it's it comes out to like 93 dollars today so you know and and seven dollars seven dollars for a book of 20 comes out to like that's $130 in today's dollar. So when you think about it, skiing was pretty expensive back then too. Um, you know? Yeah, uh, anyway. the, uh, the, the picture down there in the bottom right uh, indicates uh, that when the single chair was built in Stowe in the summer of 1940, that was the longest chairlift in the world at the time. <laughs> and yeah. You kind of look at it today and you got to wonder, but it also reached the highest altitude of any chair in the world uh, when it was built. So truly a marvel of engineering in its day. And it was all put together with red hot rivets. It was not bolted together, it was riveted together. All right. Um, quickly on this one, actually in the newsletter, it also is this uh, caption that you see up above um, talks about the fact that Nosedive was the subject of a short story in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, I actually had to do an online subscription to get this, this thing, and I could, uh, I read it actually just a, a few weeks ago, but uh, pretty interesting. Um, nosedive was getting to be pretty popular around the country, particularly down in New York, and, you know, like a lot of skiers here. Yeah, Robin asked if it was also the coldest chairlift in the world. Well, it might have been, but uh, we always had the Johnson woolen mill ponchos that were handed out all the way up until uh, uh, probably around 83 or 84. And on a really cold days, you made sure to take two woolen ponchos for the ride up. Yeah. I'm just going to give our panelists a quick time check that it's eight o'clock. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. We have I know, so much in. information to share, uh, but okay. I just wanted to. Uh, okay. Time. Okay. I thought it would be nice to show this slide. That's, um, yeah, there was about three years, three seasons where things actually were curtailed due to the war years. And the single chair when it opened was 
was usually open from 9.30 to 4. But during the war years, they opened 10 to noon. They were off for an hour. Then they opened 1 to 3.30, and they were closed on, on Wednesdays. And during these three years, no competitions were held. Um, both this octagon and the state shelter, which is the base lodge, these were constructed for the 1940-41 season anyway. Um, at this time, too, because of the war, um, all the CCC crew members were starting to get pulled away to the defense program and um, maintaining trails and so forth started to become an issue um, that was not left for the CCC, but rather on local local labor and figure out. This is a uh, 1945 or 1946 photo uh, that my dad took when he was ski patrol director. Uh, again, you're looking at Shambles Corner uh, with the trees right in the middle of the trail. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Guess, let's just leave it at that, I guess. Yeah, it looks really nice to ski, actually. <laughs> Nicer than maybe that boulevard. But um, yeah, around this time after the single chair was put in, the club formed that trail committee. And they, they actually organized, one of the issues with the, the lift is that the, the, the number of skiers on the trail increased like crazy. And the skiing conditions gotten worse because too much traffic. When it was climb and run days, the snow, the snow was perfect shape, but then the snow started deteriorating and actually more people on trail, the accident rate started to increase. So the ski club's trail committee actually arranged meetings with the uh, lift company and the Stowe Mansfield Association. They raised actually $2,000 for trail conditioning. I'm not exactly sure what that looked like, whether they had hand labor out there just shoveling snow onto the trail and packing it, but they raised $2,000, that converts to about $33,000 today. So if we compare that to today's snow conditioning budget, that's probably not even close. So by the end of the 40s, with the conditions and the traffic, a lot of people were thinking that it was gonna be the end of this, this trail for big time racing because uh, it couldn't be put in safe condition for present race, race day speeds. and. And it was not really considered fair to keep the entire trails closed just for races. So, and this one for Brian. Yeah, so this picture here is uh, 1949 uh, to early 50s. Uh, you can see how tiny the parking lot was over on the Mansfield side. Uh, in fact, uh, initially it was called the nosedive parking area. You can also see here, um, if you look very closely, you can see that the area of trees down towards the bottom there below crossover is all darker than the rest of the hill. Uh, and that's because Al Gottlieb and the CCCs 100% clear cut everything below the trail that we know as crossover today. It was nothing but a big slanted field going up from the parking lot. And that was all uh, to get firewood for, uh, for the uh, CCC buildings. Uh, there's no evidence of that today. It's all completely regrown in. But at one time, if you can imagine, that whole area was completely clear cut. You can see some of the old trails coming down, like the original Lord coming into the, um, the old T-bar line. Uh, and particularly, the, you can see the nosedive now has really started to widen out much more than it did before. But it, towards the bottom, it just disappears. <laughs> That's because uh, it, essentially it ended on a, in a, with a goat path to get back to the parking lots. So if you wanted to get to the race finish, it was a significant hike to get up there back in the early days. Hmm. And this was the area that was built by C.B. Starr in Seprusp. Um, C.B. Starr had come in the 1943-44 season and uh, got a little bit tired of waiting in line on the single chair. And he and Sep envisioned changes for Mount Mansfield and that would come in the form of a, a T-bar here in like 1947 or so. Um, and it was interesting, I have a quote down here 
um, during the winter. The snow will be constantly under maintenance to preserve the cover and give pleasant service conditions. This is artificial skiing, certainly, but extremely enjoyable and popular. <laughs> so that's what we got now, I guess. So that's pretty funny. This is interesting slide. Um, in 1950, they had the World Championships at Aspen. And uh, they also we also had a nice 1950 Easterns at Stowe. And the Austrian team all stopped on the way back to race in the downhill. And... George Maycomber actually beat the Austrians with a time of two minutes, three, two minutes, three seconds, point, point two. And it's kind of one of the first races where they beat the Europeans, which is going to continue to happen that way. But one of the interesting side story here, and I don't think um, George Maycomber's son, Jory, would mind me telling, but he, he said that his father actually cut the corner off it's one of these corners when during this race, and you can see these hay bales here for like protection. But and there's these skis down here. But I'm not saying this is a corner he cut off. But um, I don't think there was any gates on the on those um, seven turns, so I don't think anything was illegal about cutting a corner. But um, he did only win by like I don't know. Um, it was very close, <laughs> a tenth of a second. So that cutting the corner probably got him the victory. I don't know. Um, in 19, the, the ski club would win a bid to host the 1952 U.S. Nationals in order to do justice to increase its speed and technique. Um, it would require some further expansion and modernization of the nosedive in 1951. The fist rules required it increased the vertical drop of the downhill course to 2,500 feet. So um, what they did was they cut, and normally they would have started just a little ways up this section, but they cut and they started the race at the very top of the nose. So they cut that up. Um, and also for the slalom, they actually cut the upper national. Um, and this picture is thrown in here just because it kind of shows the bypass trail. And I think in the late forties, they cut the bypass simply to alleviate some of the pressure on the turns because of all the traffic. So when there was a race coming up, they could uh, kind of detour the traffic over there and prepare the, prepare the track. And I actually included the ski club logo here in the middle because that actually had an upgrade as well. And that, that, was, um, that was the ski club's fifth logo and actually was designed by Frank Springer Miller. So, yeah. Um, in 1952, CV Starr and Sepp Bruce decided that they wanted to bring the gold, the medalists from the Oslo Olympics. So um, this up here in this upper left-hand corner is uh, Andrea Mead Lawrence. Um, she won the gold and the silver at Oslo. And then down in lower, um, lower left is Otmar Schneider in the middle and Stein Erickson on the right. Uh, Otmar Schneider was a met gold medalist in slalom and silver in the GS and Stein won the GS and silver in the slalom. And this is Gutorm Berga. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He was a bronze medalist in the slalom. And he actually graduated from Middlebury in 1954. So they had, they had these, these top stars from the Olympics plus a few more. Um, this is the race program. Um, this is kind of the, the, in the race program, shows the, the trail, the map of the race venues. You can see them starting at the very top here. And really pretty interesting is that in the slalom, the slalom started at the octagon and actually went down the upper national downline and finished at the old midway station, which was like a 70, 80 second slalom. Um, and, and actually these two slides on the right, I wanted to point out that, um, um, the ski club was actually quite innovative and in, innovative in timing. Um, Seb had Longines ship over a, like six watches in a box that they used for timing. And the, the, the watches had wire that was connect coming out of the back. And there was a thin wire that used to be stretched across the finish line. And when the racer kind of broke that wire, it stopped the clocks at the bottom. But some of the ski club, ski club members, um, David Partridge, Bill Hazlett, Jed Prouty had this idea they wanted to actually not use that thin wire across, but they wanted to use a photoelectric cell. And they, Longine said it wouldn't work. 
and they seeked out um, from GE to see if they had any solutions. They didn't, but they gave him a name of a guy in Illinois, and the guy had this was working on this electric pole cell. So, at any rate, they actually made it work, and they actually connected um, wire all the way up to a start. They had a couple boards and a and a switch that would actually be turning a light on in a refrigerator and a fishing pole, and they have what what is today like almost a modern timing system. And I think it's the first of its kind happened right here on those dives. So it's uh, pretty cool. And in the museum's collection. And it's in the museum's collection, yes. Um, here's just the results. Uh, Ernie McCulloch won the downhill, which was, he was a great racer, but I think it was a shocker to beat the Europeans again. They were skunked on the downhill. Andrew Mead, uh, won the downhill. This is just from our Ski Club newsletter, some of the awards ceremony. Um, um, here's uh, some from Karen Gottlieb. There's a couple of these photos are from Karen Gottlieb. I appreciate that she donated them to us. Um, this is a picture of the parking lot, 52 Nationals, nice uh, come again sign. In the Ski Club newsletter, there was a, an article after these races that said, do big name races pay off? And by Gordon Manning, and he cited some statistics, and he said there was a, um, the most people visited Stowe that race than ever attended any ski event here before, ranging from 8,000 to 15,000, and there were more pictures taken about Mansfield, the racers, the trails, the joys and thrills of skiing than at any other time. More than 20 professional photographers were given credentials at the press room, and a wire photo machine at the toll house was sending photographs out to 650 cities within 12 minutes after they snapped on the mountain. And some 20 reporters from the largest papers in the East personally covered the events, 10 magazine editors. Um, and then there was radio coverage of the events, even uh, Voice of America. So they were making programs for foreign language broadcasts everywhere on earth. So the uh, mountain was certainly getting a fair amount of attention from this rate. Um, this, this, uh, this is a picture of the mountain that next in the summer of 52, they made some more modifications. And basically is this section here, they added the lower national and they widened nosedive down here. Because in 1953, they held the national giant slalom in the North American championships. And the giant slalom was held on national and it finished down on nosedive. Um, but you can still know at the bottom of nosedive is still pretty skinny. <laughs> All right, this is some quick uh, couple of minutes. It's a footage, footage of nosedive. I actually found this on the, on the web, on YouTube, and it's actually pretty cool. It starts off a little slow here, so bear with me. Um, and when you see the skier go down, you try to like vision like where he's, you know, where it is on the trail. And it's actually not all that easy in some places to figure out where he is. Just a quick question while we read this. Um, is the T-bar where the triple is now? Was the T-bar where the triple is now? Pretty much. It starts in the same place. Yep. And was the, um, how was the single chair higher than Sun Valley? Higher, higher than the what? Higher altitude than the Sun Valley lift. I don't know. Brian, do you know? I don't know the answer to that, but I have all pictures of all the signs making the announcement. Okay. But you don't really see any gates here on these turns. Um, this this would have been a race probably in the mid fifties. Did they have college racing on the nosedive? Or just college attendees at races? No, I don't remember it. I don't remember seeing anything about it. Yeah, I don't know where UVM raced then. <laughs> when did they start wearing helmets? <sighs> Me and Robin, you probably never at had. At least in the helmet. 60s. But they actually didn't start using fencing until not too much, not until recently. Yeah. Someone remembered mattresses on trees on the nosedive. Uh, I saw those, that picture of the hay bales, but mattresses? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, there really isn't much marking, is there? That's a little more recognizable at the bottom there after they had widened that, but still a bit of terrain in there. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, so in the 50s, there was what was the equivalent of World Cup races like almost every other year, 1953, 55, 57, 50, 60. Um, and there's some results like Ralph Miller won the downhill in 53, again beating the Europeans. And again in 55, Buddy Werner crushed the Europeans by five seconds. And then, event, then finally, Tony Seiler won the downhill in 57. And, and then again, we have um, the French starting to come on in the 60s there. So um, here are some pictures of some of the uh, um, Europeans or international stars, um, Andra Moltra, um, Otmar Schneider, this is uh, Madeline Bertold from Switzerland, Chikagaya, um, Tony Seiler, and Ernie McCulloch. There's a really good story about Chikagaya was a protege of CB Star. Um, CB kind of took him under his wing. And there's a great article in the newsletter from, I think, around 1952, which if you'd like to learn more about that, you can check that out on our website. There's some Americans. Um, I was a little bit biased to the MMSC ones. This is Billy Woods, who was a 17-year-old, um, won the National Combined Championships at Aspen in 1956. Um, Mady Springer Miller, she actually won an American International race. She was also a national champion. And Marvin Moriarty was Olympian in 56. There's uh, Andrea and Buddy Werner, Betsy Snight, Joan Hanna, and Penny Patu. I think I read once that in one of the newsletters that Buddy Werner actually drove his Porsche from Steamboat to Stowe when he came to the race. <laughs> anyway, all right, Brian. So the uh, picture in the top left is expanding the, uh, the nosedive, uh, getting it ready for racing. Uh, and the two guys you see on the right-hand side there is Sepp Rush and uh, Henry Semino. And then down at the bottom is the you know, preparation for the races in, uh, was it 66, I think, they expanded the base lodge. This picture was probably taken in 66. In, in that was the last major expansion to the uh, Mansfield base lodge. Middle picture, you can really see where they eliminated the seven turns and turned it into three turns. Um, and, uh, the thing that, the, that stuck out in my mind in this is Charlie Lord was telling me once that he was standing there watching them bulldozing. They, they had uh, multiple bulldozers and crawlers working on that project up in the turns. And one of them started to roll over. The operator jumped off it. And Charlie said that he watched that crawler roll and bounce down through the turns and it ended up down where the old sugar shack used to be actually broken in half. And the two pieces went into the woods down there. And luckily, nobody was hurt. And the picture on the right is looking up, upper nosedive, which if you look at it today, it's pretty much all closed back in. It's pretty much all grown back in together there. Yeah. So U.S. Alpine and International Championships were held March 8th. To 20th, 1966, it was estimated 10,000 spectators line race course, while more than millions more watched live and tape coverage on CBS Sports Spectacular with Jack Whitaker, ski coach Bob Biatti in 1960, Olympic sl silver slalom medalist Betsy Snipe providing commentary. Um, this race was the first time a major TV network had programmed live coverage of a ski meet since the Olympic Games at Squaw Valley in 1960. Um, because of the technical difficulties, uh, covering the downhill events, they decided to televise only the giant slalom and the slalom events and to cover the second run of the men's slalom live. Um, I think this photo on the left is probably a shot of the slalom, which came down national and finished down on, uh, on nosedive. 
Yeah. Here's some athletes, racers from the time. We got Rosie Fortna, a little bit younger Rosie Fortna than 1966. Is a photo from 1963 or 64 at Stoke Cup. Um, the um, Center top is Madeline Willoud. It's a little bit grainy photograph, but from Switzerland, she won the downhill. Guy Perriot in the upper right, um, Jean-Claude Keeley, and then Billy Kidd in the bottom center. Um, the, 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 the TV rate, um, in addition to the top American competitors, they um, sent invitations to European nations and asked for them to send four men and four women and two coaches from each event, each nation, and to help finance their transportation costs of the foreign competitors. The television rights were sold to CBS TV and the money was donated to the US Ski Association. So the club and the mountain didn't take any of that money from the TV rights. And also the races at Sun Valley that year in, in, in California were also, um, the TV rights were used to uh, help Bring, bring these foreign athletes to, to the country. Um, and this is 1967 Junior Nationals. Um, Barbara Cochran here in the middle, um, Erica Skinger. Um, this was a National Junior Championship 67. This is basically the last major race that was held on nosedive. Um, honestly, I don't know why no races continued to be held on nosedive except for the Sugar Slalom. Um, other than the fact that modern modern downhill maybe just outgrew that trail. That trail was modified over and over again to accommodate technique and faster skiing. And I think maybe maybe it that was the end of that. <laughs> um, so yeah. And uh, I know when the 70s, some downhill races moved over to Main Street on Spruce, but I think downhill in general kind of uh, in the east kind of ended with the exception of Sugarloaf eventually. So, um, yeah, and uh, let's see, I got one last slide. Um, in the 1966 Nationals program, it was sort of a pull this quote from SEP um, saying, well, though Aspen, Colorado, and Squaw Valley, you know, Olympics, uh, they held the Olympics. Uh, we've held over the years more important races with international participation than the other in the United States. And he's like, what does it mean to our community? National, international fame, yes. Direct business, no. Indirect business, yes. Um, but most important of all, it's part we play in making skiing a national sport. In competition, competitive sports, our big races have inspired many young athletes of which some have made great names for themselves. For example, Billy Kidd, the best slalom skier in the world today. It's a long process to attain the fame, which now is stows in the sports world. So I think the nosedive was really a big part of the reason that Stowe earned that nickname, Ski Capital of East anyway. So, yeah. And that's, that's it for the nosedive timeline. Awesome. There are some questions here, but I think we're going to, um, that are pretty specific, so we might need to go back to some um, maps particularly. So I think we should turn to Mammoth, because I think the thing that is really interesting is that idea of building up skiing as a sport, and that was happening across the country. So Robin and Rosie, do you want to talk about your Vermont and Mammoth connections? Or Rosie, why don't you go first, and then we'll turn it over to Robin to talk about Mammoth and her book. Okay, that would be great. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the participants out there via Zoom. I'm just amazed so many of you are there. So thank you. I just want to give you a short bio that I hope will connect a few dots that will take us to Mammoth. Uh, I grew up in Vermont and learned to ski at Mad River Glen, and I raced for the Mount Mansfield Ski Club through my high school years. The most memorable day at Mount Mansfield that I had was February 8th. 1964, and if any of you out there in the audience remember that day, uh, please raise your hand. But while training on Spruce Peak, suddenly the loudspeakers on the mountain blared out that Billy Kidd had just won the Olympic silver medal in slalom in, the in, in Innsbruck, Austria. With that, the whole mountain erupted in a single roar. It was a moment never to be forgotten. And for us young ski racers, it was a moment of inspiration. 
little did I know that four years later, I, I would be on the US Olympic team along with my friend, Robin Morning. Robin and I met for the first time in the fall of 1965 when I left Vermont to train at Mammoth with uh, Dave McCoy. I returned to the Stowe area in 1998 and soon after I became involved with the Vermont Ski Museum, served on the board of directors for 10 years. I enjoyed reconnecting with the history of Vermont skiing and working with Meredith Scott in organizing the annual Vermont Ski Hall of Fame inductions. We worked well together and we had a lot of fun in the process. So anyway, uh, just, just a little brief background. But um, when I left to go to Mammoth, it was quite a transition. Um, there were so many different changes. First of all, just a huge mountain. It was uh, above Timberline. And the first night that I was there, I'll never forget, it was snowing like crazy. And it's easy for mammoths to get five feet of snow in one night. And we were all in our bed and all of a sudden there was banging on the doors saying, okay, girls, get up, it's time to go skiing. And I said, what is this? And so anyway, all of us got up, we got dressed and, and uh, ready to go skiing. And Dave had all the snow cats out on lift one packing the trail. And anyway, we all went skiing that evening, you know, behind the snow cats and it had all the lights and everything. And so that was my first introduction to Mammoth. And uh, also the women that were out there, most of them were already on the US ski team. And so it was a pretty amazing, pretty amazing situation. And, um, um, and even uh, well, Robin, say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> what, was it, what was it like uh, seeing girls from the east coming out there into your into your turf. Oh my gosh! Well, it was great. You know, <laughs> I uh, I am a California girl, born and raised, and um, so I was involved with Mammoth since I was a junior racer. And by the time Rosie was coming out, came out, and other girls came out, it was Dave had. Uh, such a reputation that I would say approximately 80% of the women's national team was uh, training there. And when you, would you say that's accurate, Rosie? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so it was really an exciting, it was so exciting to be with everyone. First, it was fun. That was kind of a rule that Dave had is that, you know, make it fun. And he loved to see us laughing and carrying on, singing songs and as we trained. And and he believed in the more skiing, the better, which wasn't um, wasn't necessarily the rule of thumb. But so we skied long hours uh, till you know, we had another I coach come that Philippe Millard came when Dave was stepping down and his philosophy was different. So we skied half day and then about half an hour in the afternoon. Right, Rosie? Yeah. And you know, also too, thinking about my Mansfield and, and Mammoth, I think both of them were kind of the precursor to the ski academies. You know, mm -hmm. um, Matt, when I was racing for Mount Mansfield, it was the elite club to be in. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. And, you know, they really took good care of the racers. We had great training. We, we had great uh, coaches. Um, oh, when I was there, Pat Daly was the head coach and he often brought in a lot of the Austrian coaches, you know, to come, uh, Austrian instructors who were just off of the Austrian team, the national team that would work with us as well. And so we had a lot of opportunities there. And with, uh, and then going back to, to Mammoth, you know, I think Dave was probably the first person that realized that summer skiing was a good thing, that you weren't gonna get burnout. And at Mammoth, you know, if you bought a season ticket, you were guaranteed to ski through July 4th as your last day. But many times we were skiing into August and September and even longer, you know, we would, we would hike to the very top of the cornice, right? And like late, 
what, late May or June or something and ski down before the gondola was up. And, um, but with, uh, with Dave's program out there, once, once we came out there, you know, everything was uh, financially taken care of. All of your uh, travel expenses, your racer fees, uh, hotels, everything was covered. And even one, one summer, he sent another um, racer and myself to Australia, to Australia to get extra training uh, with the European teams that were there and uh, to compete in some races there. And so this is basically what they're doing today in, in the ski academies. And I know that um, Bob Biatti, who was the head of uh, the, uh, the ski team at the time, um, he, he at first he thought this was you know, ridiculous, but then he came around and he ended up bringing um, you know, the national teams out there. And now you'll see European teams training you know, through the summer out there. So it's quite, quite amazing, um, you know, what he, what he did. Did we, is there too much background noise right now, Meredith? No, it's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, why don't I go through the slides about Dave and fill in, and then Rosie, you can fill in places where mm -hmm. you, you, you um, think of something. So there's Rosie and me separate to get, but together. And uh, this photo down um, below it is the Bishop High School team, probably in um, the mid '40s. And the man in front of him was the organ, the organizer, kind of chaperone. And while, but he asked Dave to help help him with the kids, and um, that was that was the main ski racing in the West at that time was um, the high school races. And you, they all have these um, hand knit sweaters, white on the top and black on the bottom. And the Lee Vining, a town about a half an hour north of us, had red on the top and white on the or white red on the bottom, red white on the top. But yeah, so that was um, that was that 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 teach, giving attention and making people feel like a team and having all the spirit and all the coaching and all the traveling had started um, some before the war, but really took off after the war and was still going when we were racing. And now, of course, you know, it's a huge, much different kind of program like most ski areas are. But do, do I have you, Merida, switch? But please. Okay, so here's some different, some shots of Dave at different times. This is the one on the left. He... Um, was when he first came to the Eastern Sierra and little goggles, he, he uh, bought a motorcycle and that was his transportation. And a lot of times he was skiing and whatever he rode his motorcycle in. And the picture of him going up one of the rope toes that they'd installed was, uh, this is Easter. There was a, the big, there was a, this was in the thirties. There was a, and early forties. There was a big um, Inyo Mono Championship that was very important to people up and down the valley. And there was the Easter egg hunt. And the Easter egg hunt had uh, costumes. People worked on them for <laughs> weeks. And then this photo of Dave with the minarets be behind him is an iconic photograph that was actually taken by Warren Miller. Just uh, apparently Warren told me he had been asked Dave to go ski with him. And he was, he was just starting out as a photographer and he wanted to film him. But right after when Dave took off, and he'd set him up here in front of the minarets, but right um, when Dave took off, he ran out of film. And he grabbed his um, camera, steel camera that was hanging around his neck and shot this, this picture here. But the minarets, the scene of um, behind Dave is, is what is all around you when you're at Mammoth. You just, it's like the uh, Tetons and Jackson there. They're just there talking to you all the time. Okay, next one. Um, the photo on top is the Independent Ski Club in um, 1936, right after Dave, the, Dave first came to the Eastern Sierra. And it, the, it's from a town about an hour south of Mammoth. 
where um, where these people were, it's where Dave was living. Dave is the third person from the left with the white shirt on. And um, Meredith pulled this shot out because she thought she, would you want to say what you were, Meredith, what you were feeling? Oh, I, um, it's really interesting that it's the ski club movement is growing and how those ski clubs impacted the growth of the resorts. And that's very similar to what's happening in Stowe. Yeah. And these were two of the, these are really amazing men, uh, Forest Service, um, uh, different positions, but they, you know, they were always such an integral part of the conversation that went on about whether someone could put up a rope tow did they could they charge money um what what kind of ski patrol did they need to have and they were these and we were blessed in the eastern sierra with these great guys supporting what they, dave was trying to do okay next So the map is a map of, um, of the Eastern Sierra from slightly north of Los Angeles all the way up to um, almost the state line to Nevada. And you can see all the little skiers on this. These, each skier represents a tow, a rope tow that somebody was running, um, trying to build a business off of it. So this is the late 30s. And there was a tow right by Mount Whitney and then right by Kearsarge Pass, which goes over into the center of the Sierra. And, and um, the ones, there was Bishop, there was Bishop Mammoth. Anyway, just this whole series of toes of that uh, were pretty, pretty in innovative, some of them. Um, we don't have pictures of those, but this, uh, the picture in the middle of the top one is a shot of Mammoth undeveloped. So there's no chair. I think there's a few rope toes right sort of in the middle bottom part of it. And, but these, a lot of natural draws where there weren't trees and then a lot of trees that Dave ended up cutting um, with his saw and pack. Uh, yeah. So, but you can see that our nose dive is kind of an extended, <laughs> There's one right here and there's one right here and there's one right here and it's it's really beautiful skiing. There's um, you know, of course a lot of avalanche danger that they have to watch out for. And um, but that was um that was what he fell in love with. He prior to even being able to he Dave didn't have any money when he first came here and he so he was just starting from seeing people wanting to ski and having fun making the rope toes and making it all happen. And the picture on the bottom um, uh, middle is after the war and it's on McGee Mountain that's south of Mammoth, about 15, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And there's a little warming hut that he's built down on the left that, um, that the Forest Service had him take out, it was just way too, too bad because it's such an, an amazing, uh, just to be so great to have that building still there. But, um, and that was, this started after the war that Dave built these chairlifts. There was three main chair um, lifts that went all the way up through those lower bowls or the lower range, okay? The coolest story I thought from your book was that he had a portable tow that he would just put in his car and move around till he found a spot that he could get people skiing. That was it's an awesome story. Yeah, he and that was hard. I mean, you you needed to find in order to put up a tow, which everybody in the East knows, I'm sure, since you guys were the leaders, you had to be uh, near, you know, the well, the nose time. I mean, how far you guys people walked in due to the north stuff, it's pretty amazing because the criteria here was you had to be near the road, which you can see the highway there down below. You had to have snow, enough snow, which we certainly did then. There was, a, um, we don't quite get the snow that used to be, that we used to get on this particular place. But um, ah, there was something else, I forget. But these, the if, it the, the carrying the rope tow around was kind of in the beginning when he was first starting to do it. And that's exactly what he did. He, they hooked up to, a, they used elements of the car and they parked right by the road and, and 
not necessarily had a very good ski, but had a lot of fun. This, um, the, these three pictures is the first Inyo Mono Championships. And these are some of the winners. The lady second from the left is Claudette Colbert. And she, she, she might be this lady skiing down too. And Dave is over on the right. He'd ridden his motorcycle um, up to the race from Independence. And he, he, when he bought this motorcycle, he uh, built a rack on the side of it where he could put two pairs of skis, two pairs of poles, and two sets of fishing gear. And uh, so he'd come up and like, this is a, a spring race. So he'd come up and do his skiing, climbing wherever it was, and then uh, go fishing in the afternoon on the way home. And this is the, the top picture is the finish line. And you can see that the folks in the Eastern Sierra Ski Club that put this race on were just having a ball doing it. So, okay, next one. Uh, let's see, where do I start? Okay, so uh, they didn't, this is a way down the road that there would have been any heavy equipment like this uh, bulldozer shot right there. But um, mo all of Dave's equipment was surplus, surplus army, army vintage um, machinery for many, many years. And I'm just kind of stunned looking at it right now because I just had done another slideshow where there's a a cement truck that David bought a surplus, surplus, army surplus truck. And he built a rack up on behind the hood where he could put three big like 50 gallon water um, tanks and then uh, shelves where he could stack bags of cement. And then div uh, he divided the next section of the bed where he'd have to separate the sand from the pebbles and, and such. And then at the end of the truck, he had a portable cement mixer where he'd used all the ingredients and he had it in one position, but then he could swing it around and stick it out and push it up and it would pour. <laughs> and, but they had to drive that truck up those slopes that you looked at that you saw of Mammoth. They didn't go to the top and then it was the bottom, but this is, I think about 1954, the projections for the chairs that he wanted to build. And he just had, um, he started over on the right side um, where, and built, you can, if you can make it out, you can, I can't point to it, I guess. Oh yeah, good, um, sorry. Right here is chair one, the first chair that he built. And before that he had rope toes in here and he had to clear all these trees. Uh, this is sitting at the, at the lodge that he built um, in 1953 and looking out on the lower slope right there where the rope toe runs right up the side. Okay, next. Okay. That's it for... I guess so. Yeah. We share our little video though, so we get a better sense of Dave. And there are some more questions. So I think maybe we'll show the video and then bring up just the panelists and finish up the questions. If anyone has some, feel free to put them in the chat and then everybody can see everybody's faces. It's always nice. So Mike, uh, we'll trade spots here. Okay. Uh, okay. This is a little clip from Oh no, whoops, sorry, I'm getting there. Can you see my screen? Almost. There. Okay. <laughs> As Dave continued to improve his operation, he also began coaching the local ski team. He talks about how, uh, how he taught the kids how to have fun, how to want to come to the mountain, how to see the things around them, to feel the things around them, to understand them. He talks about it more like it's education than it was an athletic experience. He just 
he sees the uh, he sees the whole world completely differently, completely differently. <laughs> if uh, if they didn't make the Olympic team and if they didn't make the FIS team, which were their goals, some of them, if they only learned how to ski and have fun, that was enough for me. I definitely recommend everybody checking out that movie. It's really wonderful. But we thought that was such a great way to bring our formal presentation to an end because it just shows what everyone in this era was doing, which was just trying to build a love of skiing for anyone who wanted to come. And a lot of that happened through racing, um, both recreationally and as they brought in international racers. And there was a great quote from, um, again, my, the newsletter where it said, something about the only way recreational skiers can get better is if they follow the racers and how you know racing was so um, integral to the building of these resorts. So I think that's really fun to end that way. Um, mm -hmm. So there, Rosie, just a quick question for you. Can yes. you describe the difference between Eastern and Western skiing and the difference in training? Mm. <laughs> well, as far as the difference in skiing, that's pretty easy. Um, First of all, if you're from the East, you will be able to ski any place in the whole wide world because you have experienced <laughs> ice, black ice sometimes. And um, I always enjoyed that, to be honest with you, because I was raised on it. And uh, the harder it was, the, the better I did. So that was a huge difference. I never was a powder skier. I never really experienced that back East. And so a lot of times when like Dave would say, oh, you can go free skiing now in the powder or whatever, you know, I would just cringe because I could not <laughs> ski in the powder. <laughs> and, um, and also the, the, the racers, you know, they ski differently. You know, out west, they were a lot smoother. They, they skied more on a flat ski because they didn't have to really edge that much. Whereas um, I think back east, it was totally different in that regard. Um, as far as the training is concerned, I think that um, both, both places were comparable because uh, when I was at Mount Mansfield, we had the best coaches available. They were phenomenal. And, uh, and that was true also with uh, Mammoth. And so uh, I would say that the training really didn't differ all that much. Um, and, you know, when I was at Mount Mansfield, you know, I was pretty young, and so they never had any dry land training at that time. Whereas when, when I went out to Mammoth, well, we did that in the afternoons. You know, we would take hikes or runs and so forth. So we probably had more physical training there. But again, you know, we were older. We were older at that time. Um, I'm going to go back to some Mount Mansfield questions. Mike and Brian, if you're ready, I think we can probably do it without the map, and we'll see. Rosie and Robin, jump in anytime. Um, someone remembers Lions Nearest All Lift Ski Den. Was that Barnes Camp? It might have been, because that was owned by Chelsea Lions, L-Y-O-N-S. Um, I don't remember it being called that, but it makes some sense, yes. Okay. Um, and Robin's book, another question is where can everybody get Robin's book? It was on the last slide of that presentation, but we skipped pretty quickly past that. Um, you can get it through Blue Ox Publishing. Is that, that's the best way, right, Robin? Well, um, you can get it through Amazon. You can get it in, in California. You can get it at local bookstores at Mammoth. You can, do you, are you selling them at the museum now? I think we're in the works, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, Here's and then I, I have a website, Blue Ox Press. Blue Ox Press, okay. Yeah, and there's a, that was the name of one of the runs that he had, um, Blue Ox. So, uh, but yeah, prob so lots of options. Yes, uh, and there are two books. There's the most recent one is called For the Love of It, which is Dave and Roma's story. And then the Tracks of Passion is a photo essay about skiing in the Eastern Sierra, both of which are beautiful. Yeah, I highly, I highly recommend them. They kind of go together. Mm -hmm. They really do. And you know, in, in your book, Robin, I 
I learned so much about Dave that I never knew. You know, it's just just amazing facts in there. So I think it's a really must read for any you know ski lover and historian for sure. Yeah, and so that story, that story with um, the landscape, with skiing, with ski racing, with fishing, with each with other, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to believe where we'd be without all of these um, larger than life personalities. Yeah. The Sepp Rushs and the Perry Merrills and yeah, <laughs> Dave McCoy. Pretty yeah. um, amazing to think about them at all that. And at that all resorts had them. Certainly, um, I'd also encourage everybody to check out the museum's website and our Hall of Fame because it's a great cross section of some of the, all of the people that are involved in making skiing the sport mm -hmm. it is. And, you know, Sepp was really uh, a huge powerhouse, too. You know, he, he really, if it hadn't been for Sepp, I don't know if the Mount Mansfield Ski Club would have been as, as successful. He supported it so much and bringing all the international racers in there so that we could see, you know, see them perform and, and aspire to. It was just unbelievable. And, and he was, you know, very generous as well uh, to us. I remember, um, you know, winning the... the the uh, sugar slalom one year and and the prize was for the winner a season pass and that was such a thrill you know it was amazing but yeah. um yeah he was he was a great man for sure robin were the um european pioneers and instructors as attracted to the west as they were to the east yeah um well i you know i don't know if it was i think probably there were more in the east but definitely the ski instructors were from europe and Dave was really happy that there were ski instructors because he didn't even want to talk about ski and <laughs> about theory. He just wanted to ski with the racers. So um, yeah, we had in all those different little areas up and down the valley, there was a different person. And um, then as time went on, there, there were more and more Europeans that came in, but they were tremendous influence. And a lot of them were coaching racers in the different um, ski areas as well. Not Mammoth, but Reno Ski Bowl and Lake Tahoe and was, yeah. Um, Mike, do you know, or Mike or Brian, do you know anything about the Europeans who came to train at Stowe before the Lake Class Olympics? I, I know the Austrian team came and trained here <clears throat> and I think it was Leonard Stock won the won the gold there. So I don't know too much about where they trained or what that experience was, but it did turn out to have a gold. Must have been good enough training. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, was the Dewey Mountain connected to Giles Dewey? Brian, Mike, I think that's I, a... I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, but... There was a Dewey in the World War, one of them, right, Brian? And was it named after that Dewey, the Admiral Dewey? Oh, well, that's a possibility because there used to be a Dewey Day in Vermont. And yeah. uh, they, at one time they had a, an enormous searchlight on top of the mountain that on Dewey Day would uh, beam its light all the way into Chittenden County. So that, that's a possibility, yeah. Wow. Admiral George Dewey. Good enough guess. Yeah, it's a good guess. <laughs> I think we got most of these questions answered. If anyone thinks their question hasn't been answered, please feel free to put it back in the chat. I think we've hit on all of them. But Mike, one thing that I, um, I know we had so much information, but do you mind telling everybody about that merry-go-round race? I think that's one that would appeal to people. Yeah. Um... Actually, in 1942, the ski club actually wasn't always about the most serious races. They were always looking for races that could everyone could participate in. But they actually had a, um, a race called the Merry-Go-Round in 1942, and then I think again in 1946 after the war. But the Merry-Go-Round was consisted of four downhills in two days, and they had a downhill on the steeple, um, the Bruce Trail, the Chin Clip, and the Nose Dive. So and the combined time for um, those four downhills was the winner. And they, they did it in teams. And wow. I think, I think I don't know if the Norwich or Dartmouth team was the winners, but yeah, that sounds pretty fun. So you could have gotten to nosedive by the lift, 
you'd have to hike the chin cliff, you'd have to hike steeple, and you could have taken the lift to get to the Bruce Trail. So when, when was that, Mike? When 42 and uh, 46. And, and that was it after that? I don't know why it ended, but yeah. steeple probably, steep, you know, when the lifts came, steeple probably started to lose a little interest. Mm -hmm. And same with chin clip, they probably started growing in and no longer yeah. could, could do that. But yeah. Gail Shaw asked me about that once, that merry-go-round, thinking I didn't actually huh. know about it. And uh, he thought it was pretty cool. It, wow. but, but it was in our ski club newsletter, so hmm. I, had, I had already yeah. learned all about it. Yeah, sounds like one Dave McCoy would have liked from what yeah. I in the book. <laughs> it would have been all about <laughs> Rob, Rob, Robin was in two days. <laughs> Robin, you would have enjoyed running in that one. <laughs> and Rosie, you? <laughs> we could have been a great pair, right? We team yeah. up. <laughs> um, okay, I have a few more. So, Mike, you might need to look back at your notes. There's a question about um, in that last slide um, of the 67. Yeah. Of who was in the lower right corner and why you looked that up. Um, 67. Uh, or 67, the last one you showed us. Um, and Kim Brown says, for those who are interested, the old chin clip still exists and it is widely skied. It's the area now called Angel Food. And someone else had asked about the relationship of chin clip to Angel Food. Um, when Dale Masters started to thin it out in the mid 1980s, he marveled at how open it was. We later learned from Charlie Lord that what we know now know as Angel Food was the old chin clip. I think Lori Quest and Pat Simpson are in the lower right. Okay. I don't know. Great. Pat Maybe Simpson. That I think Candy Grant was also another one who did well in that. And uh, and Bobby Cochran, Marilyn, Hank Kashua was in that. So. And Ricky Skinger won the downhill. She was amazing downhill skier. So Richie Skinger is in the upper left one there. So. Brian Linder, you're the cat's pajamas. Thanks for sharing your knowledge of Mount Mansfield and keeping the history alive. Great, I love that. Um, yep, someone else is confirming Admiral George Dewey was born in Montpelier. And what was the cost of skiing when the parking was a quarter? That was back with the ticket books, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the, each chair you had to buy a separate ticket. So one ticket didn't get you to ride on all the T-bar and because they were owned by different companies, the lifts. And it wasn't until CB Star acquired all the assets and actually bought the Spruce, land on Spruce Peak and started developing there that one ticket could ride on all lifts. And that was probably about 1950 or so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we hit on all the questions. So fun to see all these wonderful names of people connected to the museum in the past and, and present too it's great um I, I would just say if anybody wants to really do some reading on their own about the history of the mountain the ski club newsletters are a great resource um not just about the ski club history but it's about the mountains history uh, you can learn about when lifts were installed trails were built and it's pretty good i've scanned uh, i think from 1935 all the way up to the maybe the 70s so and I'm only missing a handful so it's pretty good reading how yeah. do you access how do you access those Mike um I I don't know I can should I share my screen I, I yeah why uh, you do that someone's asking how long do you think it would take to hike up to the start, to the nosedive to the start when you had all your, with all your equipment? There's stories about the really hardy ones doing it three times. Yeah. Three um, times one day, wow. In one day. And I think a typical back then was to scoot into ranch camp, have a little tea in the morning, skin up Bruce Trail and ski down nosedive and ride the single chair back up and then ski back to ranch camp for dinner. That was like a pretty popular, popular day back in the 1940, 42, whatever, early 40s. That was when the single chair was there, but 
Nosedive Annie probably could make a few trips, I think. <laughs> yeah, someone did ask why Nosedive Annie doesn't have a trail name for her. I agree. Now, Nosedive Annie's first husband was actually very involved with the single chair and was vice president, so it seems like he could have had some pull on that, but she was actually the first, she was the first rider of the single chair, the first one to ride it, but um, yeah. Well, thank you all so much, Mike and Brian, for all of your work, and Robin for your wonderful book, and Rosie for all you've done from the museum, past and <laughs> We had a good time, Meredith, right? We did. Yeah. Color commentary on race <laughs> history is great. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and thank you, Thank you, Abby. People that, that are coming are yeah, here. Great turnout. That's yeah. it from us, Abby, I think, unless anyone else has a last comment. Oh, Mike, we didn't see your screen. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So, anyway. the newsletter. Hey, hang, hang on a second. I got to write this down. So that's great. There's also the link to Robin's books. All right, we can keep that screen up as I close this out. Um, thank you, Meredith, Mike, Brian, Robin, Rosie, for putting together a wonderful presentation uh, based on the attendance tonight, which is our highest attended Red Bench event yet. Um, the amount of questions we had and the correspondence that I had with some of you in the audience and some that weren't able to make it tonight. Um, this topic was certainly of interest and this presentation did not disappoint. Um, and thank you all of you in the audience for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And don't forget that your donation puts your name in the hat for a pair of darn tough socks. Um, I've been seeing some of the donations roll in and I really appreciate, we're, appreciate it. We really are grateful for that support. Um, follow us on social media. And stay tuned for more upcoming events. We hold these Red Bench discussions monthly. We hope you'll join us again in March. Uh, this, if you're wondering, this event was recorded and will be available on our YouTube uh, channel probably mid next week. Um, we hope you'll share the event with friends and family that maybe couldn't join us tonight. Thank you again for tuning in. Have a great evening. And that's it for tonight.